Good morning, friends. I want to say welcome to our online teaching time. You're joining us here at Vernonia Church, and my name is Sam. I'm the pastor here at Vernonia Church, and it's my privilege to share with you this morning. Hey, this morning we're going to continue our teaching where we're talking about God Talks Family. And this morning we're going to talk about how God talks a good woman. Oh, it's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to diving into this teaching today. Hey, today it's Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to you mothers and and I hope that you have just a fantastic Mother's Day with your family and also uh, today as we go through this teaching I hope that all of you whether you're a mother or a woman or whether you're a a man uh, all of you find a way to be blessed by this message today. Hey, before we do anything, I'd like to invite you to make sure you share, like, and subscribe, and hit sub notification bells. And I want to invite you to do those things that will help us expand our footprint online. That it will help us reach new people and more people. And if anything is said in this message, or if this series has been a blessing to you, and, and this series on God Talks Family is something that you think would help others, others, be sure to share it. Every once in a while, I have people ask me, hey, how can I catch up on old messages? Well, one of the best ways you can do that is you can go to www.vernonia.church. And there on that website is a spot that you can click on messages and you can click on old messages. It'll bring you to our YouTube channel where you can also subscribe and like and all that stuff. And, and you can catch up on old messages there as well. Well, I want to encourage you to make sure you're doing all those things. Also, want to encourage you, if I can be praying for you in some way, hit that connection card link below and let me know how I can be praying for you. And I want to encourage you just to hit that connection card link below and fill that out and let us know that you are here today. And, and, and let us know how this message has maybe blessed you or helped you. Well, I'd like to pray before we dive into this teaching today. And so let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you and God, we ask that you will bless this time as we dive into your word, as we talk about a good woman and and what a good woman should be and could be and, and, and the kind of good wife, good woman that we all ought to be looking for. And God, I pray that you will, you will bless us with your wisdom. I, I pray that you will bless us with a, with a message of encouragement today and that God, you will help us all to grow in our faith. It's in Jesus name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Well, this morning, our theme is going to be hats off to a good woman. The, the message we're going to get through is a message about, uh, about God talks a good woman. And we're going to look at a place where God is going to describe the most noble, the best woman there possibly could be. Now, Thomas Edison, I came across a, a quote from him. He said about his mother, he said, I did not have my mother for long, um, but she cast over me an influence which has lasted all my life. The good effects of her early training, I can never lose. If I had not been for her appreciation and her faith in me at a critical time in my experience, I should never likely have become an inventor. I was always a careless boy, and with a mother of a different mental caliber, I should have turned out badly, but her firmness, her sweetness, her goodness were potent powers to keep me on the right path. My mother was the making of me. The memory of her will always be a blessing to me. Now, I want to encourage you this morning as, as we look at this message of a good woman. We're going to be talking about the, uh, the kind of woman that is just the most amazing blessing that possibly could be. Now, some of you had a mother who maybe you wouldn't have called her a blessing because your experience was a, was a difficult one with your parents. Some of you maybe, uh, as mothers, are going to feel, as we go through a message like this, almost discouraged because you'll hear about this perfect woman and you'll 
you'll think to yourself, well, that's not me. I just can't live up to that. Now, I don't want that for you this morning. Before we dive in, I, I want you to hear a teaching from Jesus. Jesus one time said this, take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls when you come to me for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And he says to us, let me teach you. Now, what he's saying is, let me teach you. Well, when times are tough, when, when as a young mom you're stressed out and having trouble sleeping and, and there's more diapers to change and you're, you're not getting a lot of sleep because you're feeding this child and, and you're just frustrated, you're having a hard time, guess what? Jesus says, let me teach you, let me help lighten your load, lighten your burden. And, and when you're, you're not getting along with your husband and things are tough and you're having a, 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 you're having just a tough relationship right now, Jesus says, let me teach you, let me, let me show you and enlighten your burden, let me show you my grace. And maybe when you're not living up, I mean, all of us make mistakes, and as parents, we all make our mistakes, and we get more angry than we should. Maybe we discipline uh, too much or too little. Or maybe, maybe we made some mistakes, and because of our mistakes, our children made some mistakes, and we look at ourselves as failures. And Jesus says, let me teach you, let me, let me lighten your load. And the way that he lightens our load is he gives us his grace. God wants to give you his grace. As we talk about this good woman, if you're in Christ this morning, I want you to know that Jesus forgave you for your mistakes, for your shortcomings. Jesus forgives you for, for the guilty things that you've done or the things that you feel guilt over. Jesus forgives those things. He wipes them clean and he gives you a new start and he gives you a chance this morning for a new start. And what I don't want you to hear as we go through a message like this this morning is something that will burden your soul. So often I've heard from moms that, oh, you know, sometimes on, on Mother's Day we go to church and the pastor preaches on a good woman and, and man, I just feel guilty. Well, that's not our goal this morning. Our goal this morning is to bring you encouragement from a passage where, where God describes to us a noble woman. He, he will describe to us this noble woman who has all these amazing characteristics, and, and she's almost described in Psalm chapter 31 as this superwoman. I mean, you read this psalm, and you go, where is this lady? Where does she exist? And, and who is this lady? Now, there's some things we need to understand about Psalm 31 before we dive into it, and there will probably be some things that will help lighten the burden, so to speak, uh, in terms of what is happening here in this passage. Well, if we understood what the Psalms were, the Psalms are basically, or sorry, the Proverbs, the Proverbs are basically, mostly, the words of Solomon that he wrote to his son to help his son learn and gain wisdom. We're told that in, uh, in Solomon's life, God gave him the the most wisdom that anyone on earth ever had like he became the most wise person because god blessed him with that ability and so solomon in the book of proverbs is sharing his wisdom with his son and when we come to proverbs 31 it's uh, it's almost as if someone added some uh, there's a conversation between a mother and her son at the beginning of chapter 31 a mother shares her wisdom with with king lemuel we, we don't really know who that is but we we know that God wanted to share that message with us when it came to wisdom too, this, this message of a mother to a son. And, and we don't know if it was a continuation of that mother speaking with her son by the time we come to the passage that talks about this noble woman. We don't know if it was maybe uh, Solomon back talking to his son, but what we do know is, is that the the pro the proverb about uh, the section of proverbs in chapter 31 about a about a good woman a noble woman that this set of proverbs is a 
poem. It, it begins from A to Z, so to speak, in the Hebrew alphabet. Every, every line of the poem begins with the next letter of the alphabet, uh, kind of giving us the idea that this good woman is a complete woman. From A to Z, she has everything and she does everything. But it seems like it's a message to a young man about what kind of woman to pursue, what kind of woman to look for in marriage, what kind of woman would make a, a great wife or a better wife. And so I would encourage, uh, if you're a young man and you're listening and you're looking for someone to, to uh, spend your future with, you might read Proverbs chapter 31. And if you're a, a young man and you're in a relationship with someone, you might read Proverbs 31 and ask yourself, does this person measure up or at least meet some of the, of the things that it talks about in this passage? But there's something we don't often talk about when it comes to Proverbs 31. There's something we, we might overlook. And, and it's possible, I kind of think there's something to it that when it's talking about this good woman, this woman of noble character, this, this amazing wife to have in our life, I kind of think what's happening here is this young man is being encouraged to pursue wisdom as he would a wife. You see, this woman described in Proverbs 31 is going to be so super that it's almost unrealistic. I mean, I mean, she's up all night while her husband sleeps, and she's up all night working, and she's up early in the morning before anyone gets up, and she's working. She, she's traveling all over the world, and, and she's, she's starting businesses, and she's maintaining those businesses, and, and she's making sure she's propping up her husband perfectly, and she's making sure she's taking care of her kids perfectly, and she has all these relationships all in store and all in line. She's like the, the superhuman wife. And we almost look and we say, what's going on here? There seems to be more than what, what's being said, and there is, I think. You see, throughout the book of Proverbs, the book will begin personifying wisdom and the wisdom of God as a woman. Throughout the book, we will see that this, this wisdom of God is something to be pursued. This wisdom of God is a, is, is a woman who has, uh, who has the ability to help us, who has the ability to guide us, who has the ability to lead us. It's a, it's a woman we ought, to, we ought to pursue. In fact, in Proverbs 9.1, it says, wisdom has built her house. She has carved its seven columns. And we see, see this passage that we're going to look at today, and it begins with the words, a, a, a wife of noble character, who can find her? She's worth far more than rubies. And in Proverbs 16:16 16, 16, it says, "How much better to get wisdom than gold and good judgment than silver." And what I think is happening here as we describe this wife of noble character, this woman that we want to have in our life and have a relationship with as if she was a a wife as if she was a a, a real flesh and blood person in our life. I think we're talking about wisdom here. Uh, the book begins with the idea of pursuing wisdom and a relationship with wisdom, as if the, you're pursuing a relationship with a woman. And, and we're told in the middle of the book that wisdom builds her house nobly, and she, she makes sure that it's got all the foundations and pillars that, that it needs, and, and we're told to pursue wisdom as if it were worth more than gold or silver or rubies, and now we're told, to, as at the end of the book, to make sure that we have wisdom in our life as if we're married to wisdom. So I think there's sort of two things going on here. I think underneath the surface, we have this idea of pursuing wisdom as if wisdom was a woman. And, and when we read through this passage, what we're seeing are all the things that wisdom will do for us in our family, in our household, 
if we have wisdom in our life. But I think there's a, another layer here. There's another layer where a, a mom is sharing with her son or a, or a father is sharing with his young son what to look for in a, in a wife in the future. Now, I don't think we're necessarily going to say to our children, look for the perfect woman, because guess what? That woman does not exist. Just like you're not the perfect young man, so there's not a perfect woman out there. We're all sinful. We all have flaws. We all have to show grace to one another. But what are some of the things you're at least going to make, like the big block things that you're going to look for in someone? And so what I want to do on this Mother's Day is I want to, I want to say hats off to you who are living out some of the, the some of the ways of wisdom when it comes to being a mom in your home when it comes to being a woman in your home and I want to say hats off to those women who are living in in these specific ways and I also want to encourage you young men hats off to you who are looking for a woman who maybe has these characteristics and I also want to say that these characteristics I don't think they're there just for women to apply. I think they're there for all of us. These are some characteristics we all should have in our lives. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through this uh, passage about the noble woman and in Proverbs 31. If you have a Bible, open up Proverbs 31. Maybe gloss over the passages, uh, the verses that we're going to be talking about, verses 10 to 31. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to refer to parts of it as we go through. And I just want to talk about the top 10 words ways I want to tip my hat off to those of you women who are who are living wisely. The first one is this, hats off to those of you women who are trustworthy and committed just like wisdom is trustworthy and committed. Scripture will encourage young men to become one woman men, meaning they have eyes only for one man or woman, meaning they have a heart only for one woman, meaning that they stick with and they're true to their vows to that woman, that they're going to be committed to that woman, that they're going to be trustworthy uh, with that woman. Well, here I think we see the idea. It says this. It says, a, a, a wife of noble character, who can find her? She's worth far more than rubies. And then in verse 11 it says, and her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. Those of you who have been faithful in your marriage, who have been faithful and you've faithfully been one woman or one man woman, uh, I want to say hats off to you because there's a lot out there who haven't and you've been an amazing example to the families around you and you've been an amazing example to your kids. You have shown your kids and your husband that, that, that they can trust you, that they can count on you, that they can have full confidence in you. Hats off to you ladies who are trustworthy and committed and you've brought stability and strength into your home and and you've brought stability and strength and you've been a rock for your kids and an example of faithfulness and, and one thing you will notice is that all of these characteristics are characteristics we all should have uh, not just women as Christians we're called to be trustworthy and we're called to be committed to Jesus uh, Jesus would say this in, in Matthew 24 verse 45 to 46 he will say a faithful and sensible Sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his uh, his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. In other words, Jesus is watching and he's given you this family. He's given you this husband. He's given you this situation and, and blessed are you and you'll be rewarded when Jesus comes back and finds you doing doing exactly what he gave you to do. Hats off to those of you women who have been trustworthy and committed as, as wives, as moms, and trustworthy and committed as young women who have kept yourself pure and saved yourself for your husband. Blessed are you and hats off to you. Well, number two is this, hats off to you women who are invested in your families. You look at this woman in Proverbs 31, and man, she is invested. 
You see her working morning, afternoon, and night. You see her traveling. It says in Proverbs 31, 14, she's like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. Like she goes out and gathers and she brings it back. And, and in verse 13, she works with an eagerness. In verse 17, she wakes up early in the morning to provide. And it says that she works vigorously. And you look at the different ways that she uses her 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 hands it says she puts her hands to work it says she puts her fingers to work it says she puts her palms to work it says that she puts her strong arms to work and she does it all to provide for her family to lift her family up and and to help her family this woman you'll notice that she that everything she does it comes back to her family which, by the way, is what God's wisdom does for us and why God's wisdom is so valuable. The more we put it at work, the, the more it will work for us. And the more we put it to work in our life, the, the be more, more goodness it'll bring back to our family. This woman, she brings good things, variety, goodness, stability, and she brings it all back to the family and it can be applied there. I recently read about a man who said, well, I was born uh, and my mother was 45 years old. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I, I've, I've known families that had uh, one or, or, or two children in their mid-40s. And, and, uh, it, it, and, and that's, a, that's pretty late in life. I mean, it could be easy to get frustrated or bitter or it could be easy to get, uh, get angry about a situation like that. Well, well he said this. I, I recall my mother sewing clothing and making laundry soap out of grease and lye and baking bread and fixing my dad's early morning breakfast of oatmeal uh, or, or wheat hearts and packing his lunch and, and frying sandwiches and, and keeping up with the housework and helping do, me do history homework and not complaining about it. And even into her late 60s, she was tirelessly serving her family. Well, that's a guy who's describing a woman who's kind of personifying this this woman of wisdom this noble woman uh, in in her life and hats off to you women who are like that mother who are completely invested in your families number three hats off to you women who bring goodness into your homes and in our proverb and it says this she brings good not harm all the days of her life like wisdom does, you bring goodness into the home. While wisdom is personified in Proverbs as a good woman, the lack of applying wisdom is also personified as a woman. Uh, the woman uh, who has no wisdom, it will call folly or a fool or the woman stupid. In Proverbs 9, 13, it says this, the woman folly, as if that's her name, the woman folly is loud. She is undisciplined and without knowledge. She doesn't bring goodness into her home. She brings hurt and brokenness into her home. In Proverbs 14, 1, it says the wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. In Titus chapter 2, it, it, we see some instruction that Titus is supposed to give to women about their families. And it, it says this, it says, teach women to, to love their husbands and their children to live wisely and pure, to work in their homes and to do good and to be respectful to their husbands, and they will not bring shame on the word of God. They bring goodness and wisdom and good things into their home. They bring godly things into their home. Uh, when we use the word good, often when I use it, I'm using it in terms of is that good? goodness is that godliness is that something godly that's being brought into the home you're bringing godly things and godly ways and godly perspectives into your home teaching them to your children and and using them and applying them in your interaction with your husband abe lincoln once said this no one is poor who had a godly mother 
So hats off to you women who are bringing goodness into your homes. Number four, hats off to you women who help provide for your families. Sometimes it can be a situation, and most of us are in situations where where both of both of the adults in the house, both of the adults in the marriage need to help provide in some way. In verse 15, it says, she gets up and she provides food for her family. She understands that her family and her household are the first place that she has to practice faith, and so she provides for her and, and cares for her family. In 1 Timothy 5.8, it says, Those who don't care about their relatives, especially their own households, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Well, we want to be believers and practice, uh, practice providing for our immediate family, our kids and our husband, and, and we want to provide for them and take care of them and so many of you women it works so hard to provide for the people around you and wisdom is personified here pictured as working hard to provide for us that's the interesting thing about wisdom you see when we apply wisdom to our homes when we when we have wisdom in our life as if we're married to this wife of noble character the the wife of wisdom wisdom will actually bring some provisions to us sometimes they were unlooked for sometimes they we didn't know that it was going to work out that way wisdom will bring provision uh, emotionally because emotionally we can know that we're making wise choices and we're making smart decisions and and we're listening to God's wisdom when we when we make our choices and decisions and wisdom it, it can often uh, it can often bring about a, a financial provision because if we apply God's word to our finances, if we apply God's ways to our dealings financially, which by the way, the Bible talks a ton about money and money use and how to make the most of your money. And if we could apply even just what it says in Proverbs about money, we will find that wisdom will work in our favor and it will help us financially. And there will be stability in our life because there are a lot of things that wisdom will do for us that will bring about a stability whether it's an emotional a physical a financial or whatever it is wisdom brings about stability so hats off to you women who help provide for your families the way wisdom provides for your families number five hats off to you women who are supporters and encouragers in proverbs 20 uh, 31 23 it says this her husband is respected at the city gate and and where he takes his seat among the elders of the land you see this woman she encourages her husband she lifts her husband up she props him up she helps him get to a place where he can sit at the city gate with the elders she helps him become a better man R remember we're talking about wisdom first here the idea of applying wisdom to our life that's the only idea idea how you gain a, a seat at the city gate with the elders of God uh, it's w with living with wisdom and applying wisdom and, and this person earns that seat of respect because wisdom is at work in his life well when you apply wisdom you'll be propped up and when you apply wisdom you'll you'll live in a godly way and you'll help others live in a godly way and you'll share your wisdom and it will prop others up well at the same time I think there's something to be said for a woman who, well, she's an encourager to her kids and to her family. She helps her kids, she helps her kids feel lifted up. She doesn't knock them down, drag them down. She doesn't berate them or belittle them or make them feel small. No, her role in her family is to help everyone get lifted up. She encourages her kids, lifts them up. She helps them achieve goals, and, and she, she helps nurse them when they don't or when, when their egos are bruised or hurt. She helps them, and, and she helps her husband, respects him, blesses him, helps him find a place where he's propped up. And by the way, the truth is, I don't think that's something that only women are to do. I, I think all of us, the best way that we could live is to live in a way and learn to live in a way that we're— 
adding value to others, that we're propping others up, that we become encouragers. And so I want to say hats off to you women and your families because you have learned how to support and encourage the people around you. Well, I want to say hats off to another group. I want to say hats off to you women who, who like wisdom, are entrepreneurial. If you're writing that down, uh, good luck spelling it. Uh, I, I get it wrong every time I write it, and I need spell check to help me. But <laughs> and, and maybe you're great spellers, and that's not an issue. But I'm just going to reveal a little bit about myself there. But hats off to you women who are entrepreneurial. Uh, you're entrepreneurial, just like wisdom is. You see... It says in Proverbs 31:16 that, uh, that that this woman of noble character she goes to inspect a field and she buys it with her earnings uh, she plants a vineyard in Proverbs 31:18 it says she makes sure her dealings are profitable her lamp burns late into the night in Proverbs 31:24 it says she makes uh, belted linen garments and sashes to sell them to merchants and so this one woman is busy everywhere. She's busy in the morning, she's busy at night, and she's busy being a businesswoman. Well, uh, she's she's out there buying fields and planting vineyards, and she's she's making sure she's dealing in such a way that she's making a profit at the market, and then she's making linen garments, which in that day was, uh, you know, it was the it was the top, uh, the top shelf clothing of the day. You know, she was she was making Armani. You know, she was she was making the things that kings wear. She was making linen garments to sell. And again, well, we're talking about wisdom here, right? Well, if we're married to wisdom, if we're applying wisdom and God's wisdom, especially His financial wisdom, that will allow us to to make investments, and and that will allow us to put ourselves in a place where where our finance are working for us rather than against us. If we're applying wisdom, uh, well, we will be able to make investments. If we're applying wisdom, it will help us find some success, uh, financial success. I mean, that's what wisdom does. Well, many of you women in your families are like wisdom. Many of you have started side hustles and entrepreneurial pursuits, and and many of you have had maybe a career. Many of you have started a business of your own, and and hats off to you, you entrepreneurial women. Hats off to those of you who did it, while at the same time not sacrificing your relationship with your husband or your kids for your career, because you have been entrepreneurial uh, in a way that allowed you to stay still connect with your family, just like this noble woman wisdom did. Uh, You notice this wisdom, she did all that, by the way, without neglecting her family. She did it while investing in her family. And hats off to you who are entrepreneurial. Number seven, hats off to you who have actually brought godly wisdom into your life. Now we're talking about bringing godly wisdom in this whole message. But there is something to be said here uh, because this woman, in verse 26, it will say that she brings and teaches and and she shares godly wisdom with her family. She makes sure that there's godly wisdom being shared there. Uh, In in this word, for, for the way that she teaches her wisdom that we find in this passage, this, this, this word will literally mean that she shares a Torah of kindness. She shares a Torah of kindness, a wisdom of God's word. It's almost like she's not only teaching the Bible, but she's applying the Bible, and she's becoming this picture of how to live out the life that Jesus wants wants us to live. I came across a a little story about four Bible scholars who were having a conversation about their favorite translations of the Bible, and they were discussing which one of the English translations are the best. And, And one said that he thought the King James Bible was the best because it was beautiful and eloquent of speech. And if you like reading Shakespeare, you'll, you'll like the King James Bible because it was written in about the same way that, that Shakespeare, 
uh, wrote and this with the same kind of language that old English you know that old Elizabethan English well, well another said he preferred the American Standard Bible because it was an accurate translation of the original text and and another one said well I like the new international version of the Bible because it's in our modern language and it, sh it helps it, it makes it easy to understand and and that's typically that one in the new uh, living translation are typically the two that I'll read or preach from and teach from. Well, after thinking about it for a moment, the fourth scholar said this, well, I've always preferred my mother's translation. When the others expressed surprise and, and they were a little confused by what he meant, uh, he said, well, she translated it and then she translated it into life and that's the best translation I've ever seen. <laughs> and how true is that? And I want to say hats off to you mothers. Hats off to you women who have translated the word of God into your life and you have shared godly wisdom with the people around you. In Proverbs 1.8, it says this, My child, listen when your father corrects you and don't neglect your mother's instruction. And what he's talking about is the mother who teaches God's ways and God's word and don't neglect what your mother teaches you. Well, then we want to get to number eight. And I want to say hats off to you women who value industriousness rather than idleness, just like wisdom does. In verse 27, it says that she, wisdom, or, or she, this wife of noble character, she watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Now, wisdom will teach us not to be idle, that, that when we're idle, that's when bad thoughts creep in. When we're idle, that's usually when sin has time to work on our hearts and minds. And when we're idle, in the book of Proverbs, it will use a, a word that, that that infers the idea of laziness and and specifically spiritual laziness and and physical laziness and when we're lazy and when we're idle with with life and when we're lazy and when we're idle with wisdom or God's word bad things happen and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 11 uh, the Apostle Paul says to the church there in Thessalonica, he says, We hear that some of you are living idle lives. You're refusing to work and you're meddling in other people's business. And, and later he's just going to tell the, the people of that church, don't have anything to do with folks who are living idle lives. In 1 Timothy 5.11, the Apostle Paul is going to teach a young pastor named Timothy that there will be women in his church that he ought to be careful about and and he ought to teach in a specific way he will say to them that uh, they, they will either be widowed or may they're young women who are widowed or they're young women who maybe aren't married yet and and they they, they tend to have this desire or want for something that only married people ought to have and so it says this because of their physical desires uh, they will overpower their devotion to Christ uh, I want you to be careful with with them in first Timothy 5 13 to 15 he says they these women who who their physical desires desires overpower their their devotion to Christ here's some of the things that they will do they will get in the habit of being idle and going about from house to house not only do they become idlers but they become gossips and busybodies and they say things they ought not to say and they have in fact sometimes already turned away way to Satan. And so in verse 14, uh, he tells Timothy, here's what you need to do with these young ladies. He says, counsel these younger widows to marry, or these younger women, counsel them to marry, to have children, and to manage their home, and, and to, 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 to not give the opportunity for the enemy to slander. Uh, we want to make sure that we're teaching people not to be idle, even as mothers 
don't be idle even as uh, even as fathers don't be idle as people of God we don't want to be idle and wisdom this noble woman she's not idle at all she is busy she hasn't brought idleness into her home uh, but she has brought hard work into her home and guess what life is about hard work uh, Life is about hard work, working hard to accomplish the things of God in our lives, working hard to accomplish the things of God in our families and in our kids and in our in our marriages. It's all hard work, and, and we don't want to eat the bread of idleness. We want to work hard to honor God. Wisdom teaches us that idleness is disastrous. It's not good for us emotionally, spiritually, financially. It's not good in any way. It doesn't mean we don't rest, by the way. God wants us to rest. He wants us to have a, a Sabbath rest. And, and he wants us to have times where, where we come to him. And he even said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. There's a difference between a holy rest and, and idleness and wisdom. It's always at work. You notice this passage describes this woman and she's working, 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 working tirelessly and never stops. Well, here's the cool thing about wisdom. We put wisdom at work in our lives and wisdom will work even while we rest. But I want to say this. Hats off to you ladies, to you women who are women like wisdom. You don't give idle, idle living and gossip a place in your life. You don't have time to grumble or slander. You don't have time for people who grumble and slander because you're busy thinking about better things. Number nine, you're worthy of praise. Hats off to you women who are worthy of praise. Your kids praise you. Your husband praises you. Uh, the people around you praise you because you are worthy of praise. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but people praise and sing your praises. You don't have to ask for the praise. You're just busy and other people are singing your praise. Hats off to you who deserve it. Proverbs 31, 28 says this, Her children stand and bless her and her husband praises her. When you live with wisdom, when uh, you praise wisdom from the rooftops, uh, hats off to you women and uh, whose husbands think that you are worthy of praise. Hats off to you women whose kids will sing your praise. Hats off to you who are worthy of praise. And number 10, number 10 is this, hats off to you women who fear God above all else. You fear God before you fear your husband or your kids or your position in life. You fear God uh, before you fear any man, anything in this world. You fear God. You know that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and you're learning how to fear God and, and you're applying the fear of God to your life. In Proverbs 31, uh, 30, it says this. It, it finishes off by saying, charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, which by the way, those things are things that it seems like most of the women of the world are trying to accomplish and gather up. They want to have lots of charm and lots of beauty. But it says this, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be greatly praised. You young men who are listening, if you're looking for a, uh, you're looking for someone to date, you're looking for a soulmate, you're looking for someone to marry, start looking and make your number one priority. Does she fear God? Does she really fear God? And you young women, by the way, same thing for you. you. You're looking for someone to date. You're looking for that soulmate. You're looking for someone who maybe in the future you might marry, uh, which is, by the way, why you're dating. So don't even bother dating someone that's, that doesn't fear God. I, I would encourage you, look for a young man who knows the fear of God. Uh, so that you can so that you can have someone in your life that will help you in your walk with God. In 2 Timothy 1, chapter 5, we see two women who had an incredible impact on the kingdom of God. 
Now we know that the books of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy were written by the Apostle Paul to a young man named Timothy who was who was a pastor, who was a preacher, who was a church planter, uh, and, uh, and Paul is teaching him. And Paul encourages him by saying, hey, you've had some women in your life who passed something important on to you. In 2 Timothy 1.5, he says, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and I know that the same faith is strong in you. Hats off to you women, you moms, who are like Lois and Eunice, and you're passing on a strong faith to your sons and daughters. Proverbs 9:10 it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And hats off to you women who have figured that out, that fearing God first is the wisest thing you can ever do. Hats off to you because you are an example to us all. I want to share with you a little story I came across called The Mother's Journey. It says this, A young mother set foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked, and the guide said yes, and the way is hard, and you will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy, and she would not believe that anything could be better than these years. So she played with her children and gathered flowers for them all along the way. The sun shone on them, and life was good, and the young woman cried, nothing will ever be lovelier than this. Then the night came, and the storm, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold, and the mother drew them close and covered them on the, with the mantle, with her mantle, and the children said, Oh, mother, we are not afraid, for you are near, and no harm can come. The mother said, This is better than the brightness of the day, for I have taught my children courage. The morning came, and there was a hill ahead, and the children climbed and grew weary, but she said to her children, A little patience, and were there. So the children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, well, We could not have done it without you, mother. And as the mother, when she lay down at night, looked up at the stars and said, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned perseverance in the face of difficulty. Yesterday I gave them courage, and today... I gave them strength. When the next day came and the clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war and hatred, and children grope, gro groped and stumbled, and mother said, Look up and lift your eyes to the light. And the children looked up and saw above the clouds an everlasting glory, and it guided them and brought them beyond the darkness. And the mother said, This is the best day of all, for I have shown my children God. Well, the days went on, and the weeks, and months, and years, and mother grew old, and she was little and bent. But her children were strong and tall, and walked with courage, and the way was hard, and they helped their mother. And when the way was rough, they lifted her, for she was light as a feather. And at last, they came to a hill, and the golden gates opened wide, and mother said, I have reached the end of my journey. And now I know the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk alone and their children after them. And the children said, You will always walk with us, mother, even when you have gone through the gates. And they stood and watched as she went on alone, and the gates closed after her, and they said, We cannot see her, but she is still with us. Well, I want to say hats off to you, women. Hats off to you mothers who like wisdom are women of noble character. For we have found you. Hats off to you. I'd like to invite you to pray with me and we'll pray. We'll pray especially for the women, the mothers in our life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray a special blessing today on on all the women that uh, that are here i pray god that you will bring your blessing and your encouragement and you would bring an uplifting heart to them today hats off to them where they like wisdom have done some of these things 
And God, we know that you cover us with your grace. And so, God, we, we don't want to be burdened and overburdened by a message like this. We want to be encouraged and we want to be encouraging. And yet, God, we know that all of us have more wisdom to apply. And so we invite you to bring us to a place where maybe we take a hold of one of these top 10 that we talked about. And we take a hold of one of these things and we say, you know, that's not me, but it could be. And so God, help me become that person. God, I do pray your blessing once again on all the women who are joining us. I pray your blessing on all of us that we would not only find women who look like this in our life, but God, that we would seek wisdom who is the truly the woman of noble character that we ought to be pursuing. And I pray that all of us, whether men or women, would all be pursuing wisdom in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together, amen. Well, I want to say thank you for joining us as we uh, have went through that message this morning and we're talking about a, a good woman. And next week, we're going to continue this series as we talk about uh, God Talks Family. And we're going to have a message about uh, bad dads and, and what makes up a bad dad and how not to be a bad dad. And that's going to be a good message. And then we'll finish this series up with a message where we're going to talk about faithful fathers, uh, completely opposite from bad dads. And uh, that's going to be good too. So be sure to join us next week uh, as we continue the series. Also, uh, I want to say to you who are giving to Vernonia Church and who are helping support these messages and the outreach that we're doing, I want to say thank Thank you to those of you who are doing it. And I want to invite some of you to join us in giving uh, and helping uh, helping support what we're doing. Now, we uh, have been talking about giving lately. And, and those of you who are online that uh, would like to give, you're welcome to join us in giving. You can do that by going online at any time to www.vernonia.church. Uh, and, and there's a give tab there. You could click on that and you could set up online giving to help support what we're doing. And I've been talking to different people at different levels of giving every week for the last several weeks. Some of you were, were uh, you had never given before, and I encourage you to become first-time givers. Some of you, maybe you were first-time givers, and I encourage you to become regular givers. Well, this morning, I want to talk to some of you about becoming what I would call obedient givers. Now, often people will say, well, where should I start? And I would say to you, if you've never given, start somewhere. But if you want to start growing into what I would call an obedient giver, and when I talk about obedient giving, I'm going to talk about this idea of tithing. Uh, we in the church uh, use tithing as a starting point for our giving when it comes to teaching people to give. I, I personally tithe. And, and the word tithe is actually a word that doesn't mean just give any specific amount. To, well, what it means is it's proportional to what you make. And it's a 10% proportion of what you make. And I give 10%. Actually, I give more than that. But, uh, but I start at 10% of what I make when I give. And here's how I do that. I take my paycheck and I look at, well, what is my paycheck? And I'm paid on a salary. And so, uh, so I just figure out my paycheck. It's easy to do. And I, I, the first thing I do is I carve 10% off my paycheck and then I turn it around and I give it back to the church. And that's obedient, proportional. That's actually what tithing is. It's giving 10% to the church. And maybe you, you have never considered doing that. And there are all kinds of scriptures where God encourages us to give of our first fruits, to give 10% uh, of what we make to Jesus and to our local church or to the church that we're a part of that's been blessing us. And, uh, and so I do it and I want to encourage you to think about maybe taking taking a step that you haven't taken yet. You've gone from not giving to giving. You've gone from giving to uh, here and there to giving regularly. And maybe it's time for you to consider tithing. 
Now, some people might say, well, that was an Old Testament teaching, and in the New Testament, we don't have to do that. And uh, that's kind of the attitude that I used to have a long time ago. And uh, and, and I just want to share with you something that changed my mind. One time, Jesus was teaching his uh, disciples, and he was uh, he was actually criticizing some of the people that he was uh, that he was in the presence of. He would say to them, "Hey, you tithe, and you tithe so strictly that you even go to your spice." cabinet and you tithe out of your spice cabinet which which they, they they had a different economy and a different way of doing things you know at that time and, and and he said to them but you neglect important things things that are more important than your ties you neglect justice and mercy and and things like grace and and you neglect those things and what jesus said wasn't oh you should do that instead no what he said was you should have done the latter without neglecting the former you should do both you should both uh, care about justice and mercy and and grace and goodness and all the big things of god and you should also care about tithing and so what that did for me is that connected the old testament teachings about the tithe with new testament living and obeying jesus and that said to me that jesus wants me to do the same and once i learned that i said from now on i'm going to tithe and uh, and and so i want to encourage you follow me like i follow jesus if you want to take a next step in your giving it's a wise thing. We talked about biblical wisdom financially, and believe it or not, biblical wisdom financially begins with tithing and, and giving to God, which helps us figure out that all of what we have is His. It helps us direct our heart towards Him. It helps us do a lot of things. Well, I want to encourage you, take that next step in that direction. Uh, that was the bonus teaching for the day. I uh, want to invite you, though, and thank you, those of you who are tithers, those of you who are tithing and giving to Vernonia Church, those of you who are regularly giving, those of you who are first-time givers. Now, now you're welcome to start there, but uh, I would encourage you, start somewhere and think about maybe working up to that uh, w when it comes to your giving. Uh, that's how a lot of people need to do it. That's okay. Uh, but I would encourage you make that your goal. Well, let's go ahead and pray for the ministry and the work of Vernonia Church uh, that, that we're giving to. So let's pray for what we're doing here so that it will help people grow in their faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will, uh, I pray that you will bless Vernonia Church. Pray that you will help us to continue to reach new people for Christ. I pray that you will help us as we share the truth of God with this community and with our online community. I pray that you will help us, God, to share your words about, about family in a way that will help families be more godly, in a way that will help families come to know you and find find wisdom at work in their homes and transforming their homes and changing their homes into places where you are the Lord and Savior of those homes. God, I pray that you will help all of us as we serve you as your church and help us as we serve you as members of and as, uh, as attenders of Vernonia Church. God, bless this work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to join me in declaring it's been a great day. Uh, so on the count of three, it's been a great day. And then I'll finish up by declaring happy Mother's Day to you. So you ready? One, two, three. It's been a great day. Happy Mother's Day. And I hope you have a great day.